this year are projecting uh, the whatever you see on the screen is being projected in the other rooms back there. So let me see if I can hear a cheer from the back room. Can you guys hear me back there? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's working. You can hear me. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes. Um, Okay, so I want to welcome you to uh, Black Hat 2005. This is the ninth year we've been doing the event since we've started it, back in the days before the Aladdin was blown up. And uh, we continue to stay here at Caesars, and they've been pretty good to us. And uh, next year we're going to get more space, have more speaking areas, and we're going to continue to grow. Uh, you might have noticed on your schedule we've grown a little bit downstairs on the third floor. We have some breakout areas down there we're going to start trying to use, like I think the poker tournament will be down there this evening. Uh, the women, Executive Women's Forum meeting will be down there, as well as uh, the fifth speaking track. To try to give us a little bit more room as the uh, audience grows, we don't feel uh, too terribly crowded. I want everybody to have a chance to get into the room and see the speech they want to see. Now, for those of you who haven't been to a black hat before, uh, we strive to, prevent, uh, to present you with never-before-seen presentations uh, and tools. Um, we try to focus mostly on attack and uh, defense research, and as well as we, we have a policy and law panel uh, track where we try to talk about the evolving debate between uh, issues surrounding full disclosure, the law, regulation, uh, try to give you an idea of, while we're so heads down in the tech, uh, there's this other stuff going on called the law, and we should maybe be uh, at least partially aware of what it is. In the lineup this year, we have Let's see, some statistics for you. We have 15 new exploits being released or talked about. We have 13 new tools being released. And we have over 60 new presentations uh, developed. We try to accept only new content that hasn't been seen before or substantially updated content if, been, if it has been presented in, a, in another venue. Now, there's sort of a yin and yang to conferences I've found over the years. There's sort of the technical content side of things. And then there's also the social aspect. And I think attendees like a little bit of both. And so we strive really hard to create a good technical learning environment. Uh, we want you to ask questions, challenge the speakers. If you're in a presentation and they're saying something that you know to be blatantly wrong, raise your hand and let them know. They're human. They might have made a mistake. It'll be to everybody's benefit if you clarify the situation or you ask them a question. The speakers are here because they want to be here. They want to be with their peers. They're really excited about their content. And they'll be happy to talk to you. They're around to the whole conference. If you see them, talk to them. It's a great learning experience. Then on the social side of things, we try to have lots of opportunities for you to meet your peers, get a chance to figure out what they're up to, where their industry is moving to. And for that, our biggest premiere event is this evening, 6 o'clock, right outside these doors, is our gala reception. It'll run from about 6 to 8 or 9, and it's basically all the free food and drink you can handle. That's a really good chance to network. So uh, if you haven't made the time, please uh, stick around for that. It'll be worth the wait. Let's see. We have people this year coming from 36 different countries. I think that's our record. I think last year there was about 32 different countries represented here at the briefings. And uh, just off the top of the list, we found some people from Korea, uh, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and of course, lots of people from Canada. Now, let me see. Let me move to the administration before we move on to the, I introduce the introducers to the keynote. Um, I want to remind everybody to turn off their phone. <laughs> that was on cue, too. That was pretty well done. Uh, turn off your phones. Um, don't forget to raise your hand if you have a question or uh, raise your concern. Um, Wi-Fi access is now up and running. We, this is the largest amount of coverage we've ever had, thanks to Aruba. They gave us a fantastic deal on wireless, provided some fantastic technical support, and we have full coverage on this floor and downstairs, as well as we're running their uh, IDS and firewall rule set, which supposedly auto, this is their quotation, identifies and destroys rogue access points. So, <laughs> so, if all the, <laughs> so if all of a sudden your laptop just starts smoking and the screen goes blank, that's, uh, that's Aruba for you. So it would be really interesting if you guys played with it. Uh, it supposedly... <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is a challenge. Uh, they're here to learn as well. Supposedly it, uh, 
It automatically detects man in the middle attacks and it sends uh, disassociate packets to the client and spoofing the uh, AP and the AP spoofing the client and it does a lot of tricky stuff to try to keep everybody under control. So uh, it should be a big step up for us. So I'm, I'm interested to see what happens in the real world. You know, marketing hype hits uh, reality. So Wi-Fi is up. Um, <coughs> And before we move to the content, I want to thank the people that made the conference possible. And first and foremost, those are the speakers. These are the people that spent some serious time digging up some seriously cool tech, uh, and they decided to hold on to it and not release it. Hold on to it for some people, they held on to it for as far as six months, waiting to release it here to us. And I think that's really cool of them, that they wanted to hold on to their secrets until now. So I really want to, uh, I want to acknowledge the, the dedication of the speakers have put forward to make this a good conference. And uh, so I just want to recognize that in front of everybody. Also want to thank all the staff. You see these people in these fantastic bowling shirts. Raise your hand, guys. These guys are the staff that make the whole uh, show happen. And uh, a lot of them spend you know, a week or more. We've been here since last Thursday setting up for the show. So you, know, you guys might be feeling a little hungover from last night. We've been feeling it for over a week. So if you see any of them like walk into a post or stumble and collapse, you know, just kind of help them up give them some coffee, send them on their way. How come the network's not working? Um, so let's, if, we could, if we could, I'd like everybody to give a round of applause for the speakers and for the helpers. <laughs> this next one's a little self-serving, but I want to thank the audience, because without your support over the years, continued support over the years, none of this would be possible. Um, this is a business like anything else, and it takes money to run. And our only real feedback is what you tell us on the feedback forms and the way you vote with your wallet. And so far, you've been voting pretty well. So we take that as an indication that we're doing something right, and we strive really hard all year long to try to meet your expectations and grow the quality of the show. And finally, uh, there's the sponsors. And the sponsors have been very important since the beginning for Black Hat either spreading the word of Black Hat, uh, providing new information to the uh, attendees. And I think it's really interesting that as the show has grown, the level of interest in the sponsors have grown. We've had the most sponsors this year, and we've turned away the most number of sponsors. The most number of companies wanted to support the event, and we had to turn them away. We have no space, and sorry, we just can't take you. Um, so somehow, the sponsors have really recognized the value of you. They want to be here because you're here. So. They view this as one of the most technical audiences of any large event that they've been to, and that's why they want to be in front of you. And they try to bring their best engineers, and so I think if they have something important to say, and if you've got the time, you should stop by and try to meet at least all the sponsors, see if they've got anything new up their sleeve that might interest you. It's the least you can do. You'll notice on this year's badge, you get a DEF CON ticket that lets you into DEF CON for free if you stick around for the weekend. There's a barcode on there. There's no space left on the front of the badge, so the barcode ended up on the DEF CON portion of the ticket. Well, anyway, this year, the sponsors have a little laser gun that scans that. So if you don't want to dig into your pocket and pull out a business card for them, that's where the barcode is that they're going to be speaking about. You can tear that off, keep it in your pocket, and instead of passing out the business card, just let them zap that thing. So with the administrivia out of the way, it's my pleasure to introduce Penny Smith from Bindview Corporation. Uh, who will in turn introduce Gilman Louie, our keynote speaker for this year's Black Hat. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Bindview Corporation is one of the, the longest running diamond sponsor Black Hat has ever had. They've sort of stood with us through the thick and the thin. And uh, we really appreciate that level of commitment in a sponsor. Um, a few words about Bindview. Uh, over the years, they've sort of changed, but in the last few years, they've really settled down to be a global provider of IT security compliance software. Um, Bindview Solutions, uh, here comes my, my quote. It's very uh, accurate. Bindview over the years has had the Razor team, many of you know, uh, Simple Nomad. It's been developing freeware tools at Bindview, as well as uh, supporting their development internally. If you can, I would suggest you stop by their booth. They've got uh, a lounge there right around the corner. And they have experts on hand to ask and answer any of your questions. The Bindview Solutions 
remove barriers that limit an organization or corporation's ability to cost effectively uh, demonstrate due care in a corporate compliance manner and to maintain a compliance with IT security policies and regulatory mandates. As the government mandates and states mandate more and more uh, legislation, it becomes more and more difficult for a corporation to comply. Vineview Corporation focuses on solving these problems for you so your business can focus on the business of doing business. With that said, I'd like to introduce Patty Smith, or Penny Smith. Sorry. Sorry. I got a little away. Thanks, Jeff. Vineview's uh, booth this year actually really ties in well with our keynote speaker. And we didn't, I wish I could say we planned that, but we really didn't. In our booth, we actually have Halo. So in addition to being able to see product demos of how we can help you with security compliance needs, you can also sit down and play Halo 2 in between your educational sessions. And our keynote speaker is actually a pioneer in the interactive entertainment industry, including creating the Falcon F-16 flight simulator and Tetris, which he brought over from the Soviet Union. His role has changed just a little bit and, uh, since then, and what he has described to me earlier this morning is that his organization is venture capital for the CIA. That's a new concept there. Now, the challenge of creating an innovative and new business model aimed at enhancing national security convinced Gilman Louie to join NQTEL as its first president and chief executive officer. In this role, Gilman has focused on refining and evolving NQTEL's innovative model, identifying and exploring exciting new developments in technology, and perhaps most importantly, recruiting and developing a leading team of technologists, entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and strategic visionaries that share a passion for NQTEL's mission. With that, I'd like to ask you to give a warm welcome for Gilman Louie. Thanks a lot. I always said that uh, national security is like a video game without a reset button. Um, and I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking to you guys today, not so much about attacks, the latest technology, so you're going to hear a lot of that from other speakers, but trying to get to the crux of the real problem. And I, I want to put it into context of not just enterprises, but also of the, of the U.S. government, um, because we're in a state of paralysis right now. And you, you folks in the audience probably could help that out a great deal. What I want to start off with is to take a kind of a step back and, and move ourselves to a different place in time. So let's kind of think about the, the pre-Tetris days in the Soviet Union or Eastern Europe. Uh, it's the late 1970s. You kind of cross the, through the DMZ, across the bridge, across the wired fences, uh, through the guard pulses there, interrogating you and pretty much putting you down through the strip search, staring you in the eye, and letting you into this bleak and dark land. Now, in this place called Eastern Europe, you walk the streets, and there aren't a whole lot of people on the streets. There are a lot of people maybe following you around in deep, dark, shadowy areas and cars. But wherever you go, you fundamentally feel insecure. And in that state, they have lots of people whispering behind the walls because nobody wants to speak out in public. The governments are all fearful of state, losing state secrets, so they hoard it and bury it as deep as they can. They talk about themselves as winning, and everybody feels like they're losing. And as your governments go along and the population is pretty depressed and you kind of go into the stores and see nothing on the shelves, and you listen to the propaganda, and by the way, please call this number if you hear your neighbor saying anything, you think to yourself, what's going on here? And somebody in the government decides it's still not secure enough. In order to protect our great empire, Let's add more security. Let's increase the security budget. Let's get even more monitors, put up more video cameras, listen to more people talk on the telephones in order to protect our great society. And all around, as the walls are crumbling, the infrastructure, and fundamentally them losing it, 
they think they're winning. And to one day, the wall just crumbles. And the people say, enough is enough, and they leave. Now let's fast forward to where we are today. Let's talk about information security right now in the context of what we've been talking about. We talk about perimeters, guards, monitors, DMZs, credentials, passwords, centrally controlled, firewalls. We are, in fact, creating a virtual version of Eastern Europe. And we have gotten our population so scared in the language that we're talking about that people stop using the system or refuse to put the information on the system or even worse, fundamentally lose complete trust and confidence. So what's the point? And what's the point of information security? Is it just to prevent the attack? Is it to make sure that uh, at the end of the day we can claim that we reduce the, the, the penetration of our systems? The point of information security, as well as everything else we're supposed to be doing, particularly if you're a CIO out there, is supposed to be about information superiority. It's all about information effectiveness. And that is, our job is to make sure that we have the unfair competitive advantage, that we can take our information and use it in the way that we want it to basically crush the competition. That competition could be a competitor in the marketplace, or that competition could be a bad guy wanting to do heavy damage, not just to infrastructure, but to people's lives. And that's the point of the exercise here. Information security is a part of that equation that gives us information security. But there was this Air Force pilot in World War II, uh, a guy who some of you may know, General Boyd, uh, who came up with this concept. And I mean, he was a fighter pilot. You know, fighter pilots always talk with their hands. His basic view was he could beat any fight if he could do what he called a OODA loop faster than his competitor from any position. And, and, and he's proven it. I mean, he, he would go up and dogfight. Regardless of the position, he would basically be in a shooting position. you got to understand, I wrote Falcon, so I, everything's a video game to me. <laughs> so basically, he can get on somebody's six within a minute, regardless of the position. And here's what OODA stands for. Observe, orient, detect, and act. And what he said was, if I can do that faster, in, in a recursive manner, I can gain angles on my enemy to a point where I can beat them. Now, information security is the same, has the same problem. You gotta be able to orient, observe, orient, detect, and, and act faster than the guy who's trying to take you down. And the problem that we have today is in information security, we, we tend to forget one of the most important elements that's critical to our defense and critical for information security, and that is speed. Now, from a technical point, we say, you know, we got it down, we reduced out the latency, we, you know, we, we can actually respond to attack, we can send out our guards, but the problem is the human in the loop. And let me tell you about the human in the loop. The problem is not us not the people in this room, it's the people who pretend to be us, who think they know about information security. You know, it's kind of interesting, I was having this discussion, I won't name which intelligence agency, but I was having this discussion with the general counsel of this intelligence agency, telling me I can't have information sharing because I just don't understand why we need to protect sources and methods. And that you can't trust IT and because we can attack them from all different ways. Now here's a guy who has a law degree, who has no IT background lecturing me on information security and setting policy on how information should be used in the context of protecting American lives. Right? Because suddenly he's an expert in IT. How many have you gone out, talked to either your bosses or somebody out there who's lecturing you what the policy ought to be on how the use of computers should operate in your enterprise, right? You got the lawyers, the compliance officers all kind of coming on down, ringing your doorbell, telling you 
Not only do you not know how you do your job, but everything you do is wrong. And on top of that, let me tell you what you can't do. Okay, and here's a bunch of new requirements that I need to comply with uh, Sorbane's Oxley along the way. That is a broken model out there and will cause us to get to a point where people just bypass our systems. And any of you guys out there on the network, uh, in, in the enterprise world, uh, knows this to be true. You just, you know, just map the email flow traffic. How many of your employees choose not to use the corporate information infrastructure and choose to use Google or Go Home or AOL to do the real work? Right? Because it's just a lot less hassles. Right? Nobody trusts it. Now, somebody argued with me the other day about privacy. You know, privacy, privacy. You know, who cares about this stuff? You know, it, you know, it's just a bunch of you know liberal, radical Democrats from San Francisco and California to talk about you know privacy. You know, those ACLU guys. Well, let me tell you about privacy for a moment. When you don't have privacy, nobody trusts your system. Give the guys who built Tia a call. Call up the guys who are trying to put in CAPS 2 or run the Matrix program. Why do those programs get shut down before they even get started? Because nobody trusts them. Nobody trusts their approach to privacy. Look at the people who make up their privacy boards. So in the context of government and in the context of enterprise, if you don't treat other people's information as if it was yours, people stop giving you that information and stop doing business with you. The de facto result is you lose, your competitors win. So I don't know how to communicate this in a more clear form that if you don't have it, you lose. Now, we do all sorts of stupid things out there. And really dumb things. I mean, think about this. We got companies out there collecting all sorts of data. We got search engine companies collecting data on every single search ever done on their system. Okay? Why? Well, you know, one day it may be valuable. So we collect it all, put it in one place so somebody can steal it. Right? In fact, we put it all in the time, we tag it, because you have all this new metadata technology. We're going to tag it and organize it in a way so you know just what to steal that's really the good stuff. <laughs> and you ask people the question is, what are you actually doing with this? Now, CIOs, there are some really great ones out there, and there are some really bad ones. The really bad ones always have the same MO. They're out there talking about what new tools they're going to buy, how much new budget they're going to apply to their enterprise, you know, how much better wires and what's the latest gadget I can put. They think they're in the business of technology. CIOs are supposed to be in the business of information, information superiority. And that means having the right information at the right time to the right person to take an action on it. And not a lot of clutter and not a lot of junk and understanding that value of that information and having confidence, having confidence that information is right, that it is useful, and I can take an action on it because it is reliable. Not about how much more budget can I rob from the other departments. And most CIOs don't even know what's in the repositories. They can name all the Oracle databases they have, but they have no understanding of what's inside those databases. They have not a clue of how their user community actually uses that information. And even more importantly, they have no idea of what is really important and who really people care about that's on their network versus what is the garbage. It's kind of interesting. Uh, Incudel does a CEO summit every year. Most of you are not invited. And um, we bring in all the CEOs, and we bring in a bunch of people from the intelligence community, and they sit in a room, and everybody kind of shows their wares, very much like what they're going to do here. Um, John Seeley Brown's on my board. Uh, he was from, uh, some of you may know, from Xerox Park. And so John Seeley Brown put up this video. I wish I brought it with me. And it's uh, and this is an exercise in this video. Some of you may have seen it. It's, it's a, a black team and a white team on a basketball court. And your job is, in this 
two-minute video. It's a count. There's two balls being passed back and forth between the black team and the white team. And you're supposed to count how many passes go between the white team. So you know, this is a room full of not only CEOs from high-tech companies, but the best analysts and the best people from national security. So they're all they're there. The video runs, and the answer is 17. And John goes, did anybody see the gorilla? And everybody's going, what gorilla? Well, you place the video, there's a gorilla dancing around on the court floor, and the guy, there's actually a guy in the gorilla suit just dancing around, and nobody notices it because everybody's counting the passes. Now, how's that relevant to what we do? We're trying to find the boogeyman, right? We're trying to see all the attacks on our system. We're watching for that one misuse. I can say, I gotcha. And the gorilla is dancing around. We have no clue of what's going on in our network. And we don't understand how it's useful. In fact, we do what is probably the worst thing. We add so much friction into the system that we lose the OODA loop battle. Because the real OODA loop battle isn't how fast we can respond to an attack. It's how fast our corporations can respond to their customers. And you add up, we had this interesting exercise at Inkito because one of the things that this, the government wanted was a secure mobile platform. You know, how, how do you secure a laptop, right? So we said, you know, let's see what's available. So we took all this stuff from industry and dumped it into a laptop. Of course, unfortunately, we started with a Windows machine, so we already started in the hole. So, we, not a knock on Microsoft, but that's just the reality. So you pour all this stuff in the laptop, and basically this thing becomes a hunk of junk. We take this laptop, you know, 80% of the processor power is being spent watching itself, <laughs> right? This thing is, it keeps my coffee warm at least, you know, I just put my coffee right where, over, right where the CPU is, and it keeps it nice and warm. It takes three minutes to boot on a good day. It takes three minutes to boot. In fact, I actually timed it. I actually got off the airplane, got into, you know, I'm in a point now in my life where the car kind of picks me up. I, I go out to Dallas, get into the car, I hit the on switch. I'm halfway down the beltway before my app comes up. All right? And then, get this. So, you know, IDS, what a stupid idea. So, we, and we give it to the users, right? So it comes up with this executable. Do you want this DLL to be used? Now, I know all my DLLs on my machine, but what common user actually understands all the crap that's on their machines, right? Particularly a Windows-based machine. Of all the plugins, all the DLLs, all the executables, and all this stuff that kind of comes across. And so what are they supposed to, to say? Do I let it run or don't I? So we got two answers, right? You got the user who says, let everything run. Because they know if, because they want to see dancing bears that they got from the, the email message that came down. So they say, let everything through, because they're afraid that if they say no, the dancing bears will stop. <laughs> can't read that good email, can't read the good stuff. Or you get the other person who's so afraid, they say no. And they say no to that one critical DL, and the machine just stops running. And they call up the help desk, and you know now they're like on their cell phone telling the passwords. And every step they're doing to log on the machine and clear voice or clear text across the Blackberries to get their secure mobile platform to run. And they're doing it at the airport so that everybody can hear them. So, you know, how do we get to where we need to be? Well, first of all, we need to reclaim our jobs, right? Anybody who claims they're an information security person who's not an information security person, i.e. somebody who has a bar degree, just shoot them. You know, really, I mean, you, you got, I mean, people recite these rules and regulations that have no context of, of what the enterprise is trying to do. And plus, it doesn't even make any sense because somebody made up this dumb rule, you know, 20 years ago on, based on how we were using fax machines and we're living with it today because nobody ever erases a rule. You know, my view in, in information security is every time somebody makes a new policy decision, they should have to shoot no one. At least that way we can at least account for what we have. Now, there's this notion that we can just continue to build up these walls and build these guards and, 
we can kind of build better security as a way to kind of protect the bad people from getting in. But in today's virtual world, or in this information sharing world for all you guys out there who is really a govy or a contractor, there are more people inside the perimeter than outside the perimeter. Your problem, while there is nuisances on the outside and maybe there's some real threats on the outside, your real problems on the inside, right? I mean, you really think about it. You think of all the good stuff being stolen in corporate enterprises today, all the good losses that the government has to have is the insider threat. So this idea that you can put a big enough wall out there uh, and then before you launch a piece of information on a packet, you can put enough layers of protections, you know, this kind of multi-security level, you know, thing that's been going on for years, and you send it out there that you really have security and that's the end of your job, you're not. I mean, this, the, I mean even the whole thing about PKI, I mean, how much, have, how much time have we wasted on PKI, right? And then when you actually end up using it, everything stops working even if it did work. Now, and you put PKI in think, something like Outlaw. Try to do a search. And forget the fact that your search doesn't really work normally in Outlaw, but let's say Outlaw actually could look at all your PKI stuff and, 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 and can kind of go through it. What's the tax in time? Right? So I'm going through my email. Right? I'm looking at all this, you know, kind of PGB, all this PKI stuff that's going through. And it's adding 30 seconds per transaction. You know, you have to wait for the little bar to open it up, you know, a little bar comes up, and, you know, a little line kind of comes across. I do one of two things. I tell my secretary either open up anything that's encrypted and put it in an encrypted folder so I can read it. Print it out, too, so to make sure it's, you know, it's not out to the corporate printer so you can go down there and go get it. Or two, right, I just don't use it. I just don't read it. In fact, everybody on my staff knows that I operate entirely on the BlackBerry, so don't send me this crap. I'm not going to read it. And if I don't read it, I don't have to worry about it, and it must not be that important anyway, because I just wait till somebody yells in the hall that the sky is falling, or didn't you really read what this important meaning was about? So, you know, it basically cripples the enterprise, right? It's the OODA loop again. We add all these layers of complexity to the problem. The user doesn't understand it. And what do we do as an industry? We add more complexity. You know, in some ways, we need Stephen Jobs to come on down here and do the iPod for, for information security because we need to make it so the transactions are frictionless. It's interesting. My wife worked at a site before it went belly up. And one of the things they would teach you in search is every click reduces the number of clicks, the number of users who will actually go through a click by a factor of 10, by one order of magnitude. So if things are three clicks away, it's like a... You're going to get a thousand less usages out of that particular application. So you always want to put the good stuff up front. Right? How many clicks are we adding in the name of information security? There's another problem we have. It's this idea of kind of personal control. Right? We've kind of come up with this model now that we don't trust the user. So we're going to take, you know, either you're going to kind of throw all the stuff at them or we're going to say we're just going to take control away. You can't put any apps on your laptop. Good example, right? Uh, we can't deal with this particular threat, so we're just going to close down port 25, right? Let's, let's shut it down, right? That, that's the best way of dealing with email threats, make sure nobody gets any email. So we're just going to shut it down. Right? You know that cell phone or the Blackberry, you can only, this is the government, you know, it's kind of funny. I actually bought a sly rule because it's the only thing that certain government agencies will allow me to carry into the, the building because, you know, I, I come in, my laptop stays in the car, I can't even bring my camera phone, which, try to find a Blackberry without a mic these days, right? I mean, the only people buying Blackberries without a mic is, is government types. And you think about that, that the people who are in charge of our national security are left with a pen and paper to do their jobs. We have all these secure networks of which you can't get any information from one network to the next network and nobody trusts each other. Regardless of what the president says, regardless of executive orders, regardless of everybody talking about information sharing, we fundamentally don't have it. 
We are crippled beyond your wildest imagination. And everybody cites, it's those secure, damn security people. Why aren't we doing this? Is, and nobody's even asked the security people, right? That's the, most, that's the irony of all of this. Everybody's pointing to, we, have, we had the information, uh, he's called the program manager for the DNI. He's the guy in charge of information sharing. It's funny, he's, he testified yesterday in front of the Judiciary Committee of the, of the U.S. Senate of why we don't have information sharing. Now, it's interesting that this has been 47 months since the attack on 9-11. 47 months. The exact number of months it took us to win World War II. We spend $26 billion a year in the federal government on IT. And we can't even get a simple thing as email to work appropriately across our various agencies. If you're scared, it isn't because of the attack. It's because we cannot, I'm not talking about this mythical zero-day IT attack. And I'm not going to mi minimize that particular problem. I'm talking about the good old-fashioned kind. You know, like the bomb on the bus that blows up and kills a lot of people? That kind of attack. And our responsibility on the IT side is to worry about that attack in, at a higher level of concern than the IT attack. And so it is our job to remove the friction in the system. It is our job to understand. And I don't understand how an information security professional can do their job without knowing what is the data that's moving around the system and the users who are using it. I mean, do you really know your own users? Do you really know? I mean, I know. I just, I, I just look at who's on my CC. But, but do we really know what's out there? So the answer is, well, we've got to keep it all. Talk about an unsecure world. We're going to keep it all so everybody can put it in all in one place, as I said before, and have everybody steal it. Okay. So we shoot all the, shoot all the lawyers in the room. We shoot the Dr. Knows. Okay, the Dr. Knows are worse than the script buddies. These are the people with a little bit of IT security education. We're called the bean counters out there, right? They're the policy compliance enforcement types. Who, who are not the good ones. There are a lot of good ones, but just the bad ones. You just say, here's the rule in the book, and, and you know, we're just, this is the way we're going to do it. And, and, and that's all I do. And, we, and everything has to be in my context. Your business enterprise problem, you want to talk to this other person halfway across the globe because you actually got to ship your product on a schedule, it doesn't matter to me because it says that our policy won't allow it. Right? So we basically don't ship our product, or we ship a buggy product, because I can't talk to the guy over there, and our competitor cleans our clock. And I did my job. The script bunnies of information security, what I call the policy bunnies, are out there. Either educate them, get rid of them, or send them to Siberia. You know, the best thing you guys can do in the IT world is take all of those, and you know who they are in your enterprise, Give them a special project to work on. <laughs> Put them all in a room. Give them a special project. Ask for a study. Right? Have, even better, make a few really important. Tell me to share the study with the CEO who really is going to read it. Right? But this is so important. We need all you. We need to write some new policies. So study it for a while, please. And get the hell out of my way. We got to get our jobs done. We got to win in this enterprise. Now, there's some really other bad ideas floating around. Let me tell you another really bad idea, in my view. DRM is a really bad idea. Let me tell you why DRM. It's, look, I'm in a vi I usually come from the video game industry. I try actually to copy protect Tetris, and I, but, you know, I was young. <laughs> All right? So my sales plummeted because I was worried that people were stealing it. So what happened was people stopped buying my version, they all bought the Nintendo version. So that, that was really bright on my part. And I learned my lesson early in my career that copy protection doesn't work. It basically is a good way to chase your customers into somebody else's hands in a heartbeat. Well, there's also a dumb idea is how we implement DRM today. You know, everything phones home, right? All in the interest of information security. So think about this go back to your laptops, or even worse, your next generation cell phones. 
Every time you want to use an app, every time you want to use a piece of content, it calls home. And somebody comes back and says, it's okay. And by the way, since I've just upgraded my player, I'm going to patch your code on your system so that you can run my content. Because my last DRM solution got broken, but I don't want to trouble you too much. I'm just going to do it without your permission. I mean, that's a really bad idea. And then, okay, the corporations who are out kind of pushing this DRM model, and I understand the economics of it. They put all the data in a place that they have every user, every app, every call, every use. Now, we're in Las Vegas. We don't do any of that sin stuff here. Right? No, no, there's, not, there's no sin happening in this place. So you imagine all the stuff about you, every video you've watched, every song access you have, every email you've written and has been data mined that's out there. And let's say you have a responsible corporation who basically isn't going to miss the use of the information, but they're still collecting it so somebody can steal it. That's a bad idea, guys. You know, the hope, I mean, I know there's a track on there, somebody's going to talk about that. Patch management, while maybe a necessary evil, is a really bad idea. I mean, you're giving the folks the keys to the kingdom to come on in, you know, go out there, do the spoof, pretend you're somebody else's address, pretend you're Microsoft for a second, do an attack out there on the switch somewhere, and the guy thinks he's updating a machine, and a whole class of people, you know, and, and what's the guy going to do? Once you're in the operating system, or you're down at the BIOS level, it's game over. It's game over. All right. So... Let's first talk about metrics. We have all this. I went to Harvard for 12 weeks, so I had to do that because my wife wouldn't marry me because she had an advanced degree, and I went from San Francisco State, and I was a gamer, so, and, and she's a lawyer, so don't tell her any of the things I've said. <laughs> but you know, I had to be respectable to her parents, so I had to go get, you know, like the pseudo MBA from Harvard. And so, you know, I had to learn this thing called the balance scorecard. And, and all you guys, are, anybody in the enterprise suffering with the balance scorecard, you know, this how they rate and evaluate your performance against stakeholders. It's really interesting to kind of look at these balance scorecards for IT professionals, particularly for information security people. And, it's, you know, it's like how many attacks did you prevent? How do I know how many attacks I prevented? Well, whatever. <laughs> you know, and it's like, uh, what was my mean failure time and uptime? And it doesn't have anything to do with it. Has anybody actually used the information on my system? So the, the metrics are wrong. And we think, and, and we've bought, bought into this. I mean, we, 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 you know, it's defense, right? It's not about effectiveness or the use of the information. It's defense. So we bought into somebody else's view of how well we do our jobs. And I can tell you, I may not tell, can't tell whether or not you're, you're winning, but I can sure as hell tell you when you lose. You lose, the definition of failure is when the competitor beats you, and the competitor isn't another piece of IT out there. Your competitor is the guy who's selling the product that your company is supposed to be selling, or the competitor is that terrorist who wants to kill you. All right? so I know the definition of failure. So let me read illustrate some good ideas on the metrics of success for an IT professional. The first question you got to ask is, does the enterprise, does the users even trust your IT environment? And you can easily tell that is, look at the number of out-of-band communications versus in-band communications. How many times are people willing to go outside of your system to get their jobs done versus inside the system? Can you find the person who has the good stuff? Right? Can anybody in enterprise in your system find the good stuff? And can you trace back? Right? If there's something out there and somebody, let's, let's forget about the attack for a moment. Let's think about the bad piece of information. Right? A bad piece of information is like the white van in the sniper situation. A bad piece of information could be aluminum tubes and WMD. Right? Can you actually, as information professionals, identify who relied on that piece of information? how that information propagated through the system. I mean, everybody in this room uses eBay. Where's our reputation index for information that's out there? How, particularly in an environment where you don't know who the, the other user is, how do you know that the end user or the person who gave you the information 
or where this information came from, is trusted. And God, did we distort the word trust? I mean, because trust is now this PKI thing, right? Like, no, trust is, can I rely on this information? And we have no way to do that. Let me get another good metric. How long does it take for a person to get to the information that they actually need? And when they get to it, is it in a form that they can actually use it and pass it along? Have you ever done the timing test? And have you ever done that with the stopwatch and understand how long it takes? Particularly when you've got a human in the loop where you, gotta, you, know, you have these permissioning systems when it comes out on the other end, you've got to say, hey, guys, uh, before you can send this information, you've got to get Joe's permission. How long does that take? How long does it take to get a policy change when you know it's the right thing for your enterprise? Let me tell you, and, and, and how long does it take you as a professional to integrate a new piece of technology or an app into your system, including all your policy boards? Right? It's not just the procurement time and the tech time for integration, but actually all the steps that's necessary to get in. And by the time you get in there, how old is that technology? Now, I got to tell you, in the federal government, it's pretty scary you walk around and you see OS2 machines. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's not a good, pretty picture. And, and enterprises are not that much better off either. And it's really worrisome. So, Incutel's is venture capital fund. So, what's our bets? So, we're really, we're not, you know, we focus in on the kinds of things that you would think we were focusing on. So, I mean, investments in companies like Net Chemistry that's doing you know, monitoring of the stuff, wireless networks, so we make, make sure there's no seepages, and it's the crew protecting data at rest, and it's arc site, so I can not have a three-mile high version of my information appliances where there's so much to monitor that I'm not monitoring anything at all. Um, and it's things like A4 Vision, who's doing biometrics, but the, actually the interesting stuff that we're working on is none of that stuff. Those are great companies and strike at the heart of information security. But it's things like visual sciences. You know, go check them out on the website. It's tools that allow the IT professional and the enterprise to understand how all the information is being used in real time in their entire network. All the flows and the ability of who's touched it and who's used it. It's things like tacit. Can I find the person who has the same interest that I have, and I, can I do that in this secure kind of trusted way so that I can reveal myself, get the other person to reveal myself when it's appropriate. It's things like spot fire and, and, and being able to look for anonymous detections by using visualization technologies. And the big push that I have now on our team is to focus in on non-English-based text and non-text products. Because the reality as voice IP over IP and video over IP becomes real, none of this stuff is going to be text. None of this, the attachments are going to be voice. It's going to be video. It's not even going to be on a laptop. It's going to be on your hip. So think about all the investments that we've made to deal with the text English-based email problem and compliance. You know, it's a restart for this industry when we get in that environment. And we have not thought through the implications and the tools necessary to provide real information assurance, real information effectiveness in a non-tax, non-English based world. Now, let me finish up with what I think is really, really important. Let me just say, at least from an IT perspective, we are losing the war on terror. The bad guys are winning. And it's not in the way that you guys think. The bad guys are winning because basically we have convinced ourselves that our networks are so insecure and that we don't have the appropriate ability to trust the usage of our information that we're not going to put it on the system. It's Pearl Harbor all over again. You know, for those, go watch Torah, Torah, Torah. It's a great movie. All right? Not Pearl Harbor, the, the crappy movie. Tor, Tor, Tor. Tor, 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 you know, it's interesting because everybody had all the information necessary to, to determine that an attack was imminent and was going to take place. But nobody shared it. And even on the day of the event, as the radar is, I mean, this is really great. We were talking over breakfast, uh, you know, what's the big problem with alarms? 
is that whenever an alarm goes off, the first thing we do is explain it away. Right? Car alarm goes off. Oh, somebody just bumped it. Right? Uh, alarm goes off in the building. It's the balloons from the party last night triggering the sensor thing. Or that, you know, that, that sensor always goes off. Now, we assume that it's, it is when an alarm goes off in the IT world, it's basically a mistake. And the same thing happened in Pearl Harbor. You know, a little destroyer goes off this lung, you can tend it sinks a sub. You know what they were talking about? That guy's in the world of hurt when he comes home. Because he probably dropped the, you know, he probably sank one of ours. Boy, is he in deep shit. You know, the guy's sitting there looking at the radar and he goes, there's a bunch of planes coming our way. So the B-17's coming in from California. Let's go have breakfast. Right? And think about what we're doing right now. Even if we had information sharing. And by the way, the inf definition of information sharing today is give me your data. Sort of like my son. Daddy share it means he wants, to, he wants my toy. He wants my laptop. I, he never says share and he gives me something. <laughs> right? Sharing by definition in the IT world is give me your stuff. And since nobody gives anybody the stuff, the tack is imminent. I'm telling you today, the attack is imminent. London is coming to the United States. London's coming to the United States. It's going to happen here. And the problem that we have is that we are the fall guys. When you go through, and I can hear the testimony today. This is one of the th interesting things. I'm kind of this now six-year veteran gamer now in the information kind of national security apparatus. And they're all going to blame the information security guys who wouldn't let us share. The reality it is that actually they never talk to us is they don't want to share. We have to remove all their excuses of sharing. You know, the, the perfection is the enemy of the good here. Now, I, I listen to all these policy wonks who are telling me we can't implement this particular piece of technology because it's not perfect. Right? As if the Xerox machine and telephone and that lock in the room is. Right? They never compare it to what they got. They only compare it against perfection. And use that as an excuse of why they don't have to share. We got to educate and we got to correct. People are going to die. 47 months after 9 11, we have testimony of how we're going to approach information sharing yesterday. So yesterday is the first official day that we're actually even talking about it. My God, it isn't the federal government. I mean, they look at contempt of law enforcement out in the street. They said, why would you ever give it to a cop? Mainly because the cop's the first guy who's going to come across the bomb and kick it. Maybe he or she ought to know. Where's the terrorist most likely going to show up? On a pullover or on a traffic violation. You kind of think that they would actually need to know this stuff. But it's so precious and so secret, we can't afford to give it to them. It's coming and it's going to happen and we're going to be blamed for it. So I got to say this. This is a great industry. We've made a lot of progress in information security. But we better change this conversation in a hurry to information effectiveness. And everybody who's an information security officer better be an information effectiveness officer. And we got to make our enterprises successful in the commercial world. Yes, we do have to guard against attacks. I'm not saying tear down the walls. But we got to take the friction out of the system and stop making us the scapegoats. You guys, and for all you guys who are govies pretending to be black hats in the room, Right? Turn to your friends on the side. They're no longer your enemies. Right? Because they'll give you the tools necessary to, for you to go back and show how information can be. It isn't a question of whether information can be stolen or not anymore, particularly in the information national security apparatus. It's whether I can use that information to prevent somebody from killing me before they kill me. It's speed. It is no good to put the information into a safe and lock it away, why do we even collect it in the first place? And government needs its own version of Sorbanes-Oxley. Because as they're trying to stick it to all the enterprises and, and everybody else there, they should clean up their own house first.
So thank you very much. Have a wonderful conference.